Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the second Space Renaissance panel. I'm excited to be your moderator for this fun topic. Uh, we just got to hear from David Newman just a little bit ago about some fun stuff going on in space. Uh, I think this will be equally as exciting conversation with a really uh, awesome group. So I'm Phil Larson. I'm an assistant dean here at CU Boulder in the College of Engineering and Applied Science. I'm uh, just starting my second month. I come from a company called SpaceX. And before that, I was in the uh, Obama administration working on space and science policy. Got to work with David there. So without further ado, let me just introduce our panel. Seth Shostak uh, is a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Um, next to Seth, we have Deva, David Newman, Depu former Deputy Administrator of NASA, uh, and an aeronautics and astronautics professor uh, at MIT. Uh, to Deva's right, we have Sidney Perkowitz, the Candler Professor of Physics Emeritus uh, at Emory University. Uh, and next to Sydney, we have uh, David Kloss, who is a professor here at CU uh, in Aerospace Engineering Sciences and also a former, uh, uh, worked on the Space Shuttle program. So please welcome our panel uh, and let's get the discussion started. So in this CWA session, we'll, we'll utilize both the CWA app and a note card system for taking your questions. Uh, to ask a question in the app, simply select this session, tap live Q&A, and then insert uh, your question. You may also raise your hand at any time uh, to request a note card uh, and pencil from one of our producers, and then hand uh, the note card to the producer. If you're a student, please note this in your question, that you are a student, and questioners who would like to verbalize their question can note this in the text, uh, including your name, and if, and if we uh, get to your question, we'll recognize you and invite you to one of the microphones. So again, thank you for being here. Seth, you want to kick us off? I guess so. Do, oh, this does work. Okay. Well, I didn't expect to be going first, and Deva, in her keynote speech here, has essentially stolen all the thunder from this session. So I think I'm just going to tell you about what I did my last summer vacation. <laughs> Actually, I was intrigued by the title of this, The Second Space Renaissance, because I was trying to think, well, when, when was the first space renaissance? Because, of course, a renaissance is a rebirth. And, you know, I, I was actually alive in, the, in 1957 when Sputnik went up. In fact, not only was I alive, but I was already thinking of retiring. And, you know, I went out in the evening to watch this thing, you know, go overhead. Well, you couldn't see it, of course. But, you know, later on, there's some of the later things like the echo satellites and so forth. You could see them very easily. And that was really quite exciting. But to hear the beep, beep, beep coming down from Sputnik, you know, I mean, my parents were worried that they were going to be launching uh, bombs in our direction. They saw the strategic importance of it. But to me, it was just a very interesting thing to put something the size of a basketball into space. And that was maybe the beginning of the space age. It's conventionally called that. So when was the first renaissance? I don't know. We, we went to the moon, but that was all sort of continuous development. And going to the moon was impressive, but it, it, you know, it isn't so far. It's 250,000 miles, right? And that's usually the average lifetime of a, a Lexus or something. So it's not all that far. Uh, but trying to go farther than the moon is quite hard, and David uh, alluded to that. I mean, to go to our little ruddy buddy, which is the next obvious target, namely Mars. Mars is everyone's favorite inhabited planet. There are Martians in movies and books and radio plays. In one place there may not be life on, or may not be Martians, might be Mars. But actually I'm willing to bet that there once were microbes on Mars and maybe there still are. That could be. Just go down a couple of hundred feet and pull up the dirt and look at it under a microscope. Maybe you'll see something there. But uh, going to Mars, you know, it's 120 times further at best. So that's two orders of magnitude farther. Now, you don't need two orders of magnitude more rocket thrust to do it, but on the other hand, you have to have all this life support stuff if you're going to go there. And if you want a round trip, uh, it's even harder. In fact, as, as some of you may know, there's an initiative out of the Netherlands called Mars One, O-N-E, One. Uh, Bas Lonsdorp, I think, is the guy who's doing it. In any case, he has signed up thousands of people who are willing to go to Mars on a one-way ticket. How many of you would go to Mars on a one-way ticket? C? I want to know the average age, by the way, but okay. <laughs> right. All right. Um, actually, I talked to a, um, she was a physics undergrad at Duke University a couple, 
months ago for a radio show we do. And then asked her, she was signed up and she'd made the cut to be one of the, you know, the top 100 or 200 to go. And I asked her, how do your parents feel about the idea that you may be going to Mars on a one-way ticket? And she seemed to think they were happy with the idea. So I, I hope she has siblings. I don't know what the deal is. All right, anyhow, but Mars is harder. But I'm going to try and take the long-term view here because my fellow panelists here know infinitely more than I do about how the space program is over. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing to sit next to David and pretend to talk about our immediate plans for space. So I'm going to speculate on the long term. That's all it will be, speculation. But, you know, you can ask yourself, because this is what you've been conditioned to think. Will our descendants be, you know, living on uh, French fries on Mars, growing potatoes on Mars, or maybe blasting Klingons from the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, that kind of thing? Well, scale is important here, as I say. Mars is 120 times farther than the moon. The moons of Saturn, which could conceivably be the closest worlds with life, right, places like Titan, Enceladus, these kind of places, they have liquids. And in the case of Titan, they have liquids right on the surface there. Well, that's 4,000 times farther than the moon. Okay, so that, that's a big step. If you want to go to, if, <laughs> if you want to find the kind of extraterrestrial life that can hold up its side of the conversation, which is to say the little gray guys with the big eyeballs and no hair, no clothes, and their only interest is in hauling you out of your bedroom. Proxima b is the nearest other star system to us, right? And that's 100 million times as far as the moon. Okay, so the, the bottom line of that is it, it's the solar system for a long time. Take it or leave it. it it's maybe the solar system forever, depending on what we do here on Earth. Because uh, you say, well, yeah, wait a minute, wait a minute. Our rockets, the best rockets, you know, NASA builds go 10 miles a second, right? And that's great if you're going to Loveland, <laughs> although it's unclear why you'd want to do that. Um, <laughs> and it's not so bad for going to the moon or even to Mars or even to the outer solar system. You could do it in a, you know, certainly within a human lifetime. But obviously at that speed to go to Proxima B takes you 75,000 years, which, as I pointed out before, in a middle seat with only peanuts to eat is no good. So how are you going to do it? Um, well, there are various plans. You could scoop the fuel as you go, you know, interstellar ramjets, just take some of the hydrogen that hangs between the stars, you know, there are a couple of hydrogen atoms every cubic centimeter there, and just, you, you know, essentially have a H-bomb in your rocket and send the exhaust out the back and off you go. Uh, it's hard to make that work, but you might be able to work it. The trouble is the scoop has to be miles across, so it's, it's, uh, it's a little tough. The other thing is to have really powerful lasers and then just have a big sail on your spacecraft and just shoot it with the lasers off to uh, a distant uh, target. The trouble is the lasers have to sort of follow you and keep pushing you for years, many years. And of course, if there's a labor strike back on Earth, you know, maybe, maybe you're just caught out there. You know, it could be bad. And the other possibilities have generation ships. This is common in science fiction. You put a thousand men and women on board this ship and you say, you're not going to get there, Bob, but that's okay. Uh, your kids won't get there either, and their kids won't get there, and then their kids won't get there, but eventually somebody will get there. And that's kind of in intriguing, but stupid, because it isn't going to work, right? The, 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 uh, <laughs> the, the psychologists and the anthropologists and everybody else who studies this thing, they say, to begin with, the men are going to start fighting about the women. They'll probably all be dead within one generation, but even if not, can you imagine, you're, you know, you're the 40th generation, whatever, and you finally get to this other star system, and all the expertise that was launched in the beginning is gone. Nobody knows what they're doing there. Nobody knows why they're there, and they probably don't like one another either. So that probably isn't going to work either. So it's going to be the solar system for a while, but let me just say two more things about the solar system so that you won't be totally discouraged by these sort of dystopian remarks. Um, to begin with, obviously, we talk about colonizing the moon and Mars, and I'm sure we'll do that. We gotta do that. I mean, it's a good thing to inoculate us, uh, ourselves against self-destruction, having some people, some hominids on other planets, just in case the, you know, the Earth goes nuclear and blows everything up, at least you know, uh, there, there's somebody else to start all over again. That might be a good thing. But Mars and Moon are both very tough environments. Even Mars is a tough environment. We heard a little bit about that. It's very cold, even colder than Boulder. And you know, the, the air, the, the air is even thinner than Boulder, right? And uh, there's no liquid water on the surface and so forth and so on. So it's going to take a lot of work to make it habitable. I mean, you're going to have to be indoors all the time, at least in the beginning, unless you put on a spacesuit and walk around. Uh, a much better place would be the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt, if you add up, if you took all the asteroids and put them on a scale, they weigh less than the Earth, but they have 10,000 times as much acreage as the Earth. 
So there's a lot of room for condo development on the asteroids. And the other thing about the asteroids is they have, you know, all you need for your gusto grabbing lifestyle. They have all the, you know, the, the element, the rare earth, the metals, the things that you need for technology, and they get a, you know, maybe a, a third as much sunlight as we get here, a little less actually. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you could grow things there. So the asteroids are attractive. Many people think that's where your descendants will live on the asteroids. The other possibility is rotating aluminum cans in space, orbiting colonies that you could get to in a, in a, in a few minutes from Earth with a rocket. And uh, that may be the most practical thing, that we don't actually live on another world, we live on artificially constructed worlds. I think that's the way to go. But let me say, if there's going to be another renaissance, I mean, Elon Musk hasn't bought the Sistine Chapel, so I don't know that we're at the, the stage of the second renaissance here, but if there really is going to be another resonance, res <laughs> resonance, there is a resonance in this room, another renaissance, then it, it's, it's not going to be any of these things. It's going to be when we switch from rockets to something like the space elevator, when going into space requires no more money than flying to New York. Thank you, Seth. Deva? Hello again, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, Seth gave us a lot to think about, so I'll tailor my, my remarks. You've heard from me, but uh, I'm here to ask questions this time, So, because uh, we're always asked it, you know, again, why, why explore? And um, fundamentally, um, to me, it's actually to raise human potential. To what is our potentiality? So it really is all about uh, making the impossible possible. And we can do that every day, but um, to me, that really is uh, where the discussion starts. Is it a second renaissance? Um, if it were, uh, just for argument's sake, then uh, what did it take for the first renaissance? I think historically, it's really interesting to, to look at that. And I mentioned this a little bit before in my comments, but I think it takes everyone, and I definitely think it takes all disciplines. I know that you know it's not going to be just the engineers and the scientists, right? Uh, you know, what about the musicians? What about what about the the artists? Um, they really have equal uh, amount to to play in in causing this second space renaissance. Because it again, it's for humanity. I believe that it's for humanity. Then you need the orchestrator for sure. You know, the orchestra conductor um, to to bring everyone together. Now. Uh, I think I'll uh, make a comment or two, a little bit uh, more about the, the public-private uh, partnership nature. Uh, both both in, and Phil is going to be our moderator, but he can comment this as well because with the Obama administration, um, you know, pushing uh, innovation, thinking about uh, how can we do it differently. That that was really one of our mandates. How can we do this differently? Make no bones about it. Uh, SpaceX and, and Elon is being funded by the government, and he's very thankful, and he always acknowledges that, that SpaceX is being funded by the U.S. government, but. That's because that's what governments probably do best. Seed, seed industry, seed the funds. I like to bring uh, Blue Origin, we should talk about a little bit when we talk about these breakthroughs, um, because Jeff Bezos is funding his, his own company, uh, Blue Origin. He has three Space Act agreements with NASA, but uh, just very little funding. But uh, all the rest of the, the new players, if you will, most of them are being funded by the government. I, that's fantastic, that's what we wanted to do. You know, new renaissance, or how do we, how do we change the paradigm? Because clearly, um, again, from uh, where I said, you want to commercialize low Earth orbit first. Does the business case close for small sats? Absolutely. You know, communications, services from low Earth orbit. We've been stuck in low Earth orbit for 40 years. That's not satisfactory for someone like me who wants to get people to Mars, right? But how do you break that? So I think it is actually with these new partnerships. You have to commercialize low Earth orbit. Then there's talk. We can, dis we can talk about it in questions. You know, can you commercialize cislunar space? That's Earth moon, uh, habitats. Tourism. We can talk about these business cases. Do they close or not? But that's those are really the questions. If you can commercialize close to Earth, low Earth orbit, maybe moving out to cis lunar, then that's fantastic. Why? Because then world governments, they can do the next step in exploration, which again I think is agree with Seth. It's in the solar system. I think it's Mars, uh, not the asteroids. I mean, scientifically we're looking at the asteroids, but if you look at Mars, all the land on Mars is equal. Mars is half the size of Earth, but all the land on Mars is equal to the land mass. Um, on Earth as well. Then you go to the oceans, as, as we talked a little bit about before. So um, then I want to have another another question or challenge that I'd love to, to talk about to the panelists and, and all of you. When we get out there and we find life, and we will find life, I predict we'll find life uh, in the next decade. 
As an academic, I would have never said that a couple of years ago. It took me going to the government <laughs> with all this data and 100 space missions to say, I think we will find life hopefully within the next decade. Now, it might be dead, small, fossilized, but you know, the evidence, the evidence of, of life or past life. How do we send, so the, the, the pioneer, the great golden record that was sent now, what, gosh, uh, 50 years ago. So I like to think about the golden record redo. How do we send our image? What messages do we want to send out, you know, on the next uh, voyagers and, and pioneers? So uh, again, I've been thinking about it. I'd love to get, you know, people to comment with us on that too. How do we send um, our reflection, humanity? What do we tell, you know, the universe? And how do we, is it our music? Is it, uh, you know, genders, binary code went last time, some artwork, um, some music. But again, how it's, I think, kind of fundamental, philosophically, how do we represent humanity to, let's say, uh, out into the universe? So I think I'm gonna keep my comments short and uh, mostly you know, tease with those questions and I look forward to talking to the panelists and, and the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you, Deva. <laughs> Sydney. Good afternoon, everybody. My mic's on, you can hear me? Good. You keep inviting me back here, which I'm delighted by. It proves I'm fooling you every time, so thank you for being fooled. I show up well on the panels, apparently well enough to be invited back. This is a great panel because everyone before me has said good things that it's possible to build on. And I also want to talk about a second renaissance, but I also want to talk a little bit more about Mars. Dave very proudly said that NASA has been looking at Mars for 50 years. But you really need to remember where the dream started. Humanity has been looking at Mars for as long as we've been around. And since the time of the Romans, we've had some kind of relationship with that planet. Like most long distance relationships, it didn't start in a very good way because Mars was the god of war. It was the red planet, and that was scary. Now we've come to terms, everyone loves Mars now because we think that's where the aliens are most likely to be. We've all read that science fiction. So reaching Mars is a huge achievement. As Seth said, that would take us anywhere from 150 to 200 times further than we've yet dipped a toe into space, and that's phenomenal. And that, to me, would be the beginning of the second resonance, a renaissance, which would be moving into interstellar space. And that's why things are really exciting now, because we keep finding planets that we didn't know existed. 25 years ago, if you asked anyone from a school kid to a college professor how many planets are there, the answer would have been either nine or eventually eight. Now there are thousands and thousands because we found them elsewhere. And some of them could maybe even support life. By the way, one thing that hasn't been mentioned yet among, among all the comments so far, not only do these planets exist, there's good reason to think that they all might have water. There's been some recent work done that says that about half of the water on Earth that exists now, that you drink out of your water bottle, is older than the sun because it was formed before our solar system formed. And that means any time a planet in a solar system form, water comes along with it. So the odds are certainly have suddenly gone way up that we'll find water wherever we find planets, and that means maybe find life. So as I was recently uh, asked by an interviewer for a, for a, a TV series, do I th what do I think of the odds for life being found elsewhere? My answer was the odds go up every year, and I think, that, I think that's quite true. The problem with these interesting planets is they're so far. The most recent ones that you've heard about, Proxima Centauri, is a star, a planet around Proxima Centauri is a star that's about four light years away. Now four is a nice small number. That sounds comfortable, like a backyard number. The issue is in the word light years. <laughs> and if you go back to the furthest that humanity has gone into space, that's the Voyager 1 spacecraft I looked up, the year was launched, it was 1977, so that's 40 years ago. And you can do the math right now on, on your phone, if you like, or in your head. 40 years, 365 days, 24 hours a day, multiply at, at uh, 35,000 miles an hour, multiply it all out. How many light years has Voyager gone so far? Anyone care to answer? One, two, point five. The answer is 0 .0002 light years. So go back to Proxima Centauri, four light years away, do some very simple math, as Seth already said, but it bears repeating, at the speeds that NASA can now reach, 
that, my, that today's technology will do for us, 80,000 years roughly one way trip to the nearest planet that we think might be habitable. Seth gave all the reasons why that's very impractical, maybe won't happen. DARPA and NASA agree, uh, the two of them together have funded a conference series called The 100 Year Starship. It's now met, I think, five times. And the title means, in the estimate of these two agencies, and if you don't know what DARPA is, that's the research arm of the Department of Defense, which is famous for pushing the most far out possible ideas. And of course, you all know that NASA is a great scientific establishment. Between the two of them, they think it would take maybe 100 years to put together technology that might get us to the nearest star and take into account the fact that, by the way, we're limited by the speed of light. So the 100-year starship has tried every possible scheme it can imagine to find a viable way to get there. No one has come up with a good idea yet that really seems believable at an engineering level, one that we can really carry out. The answer might indeed be that the future for the second renaissance will be carried out by robots, not by us, as humans. There's this natural human need uh, to lay eyes on the object you're looking at. We would all like to be right there next to that planet four light years away and eyeball it ourselves. But we might have to ask robots to do that, or maybe our genetic clones who are carried there by spacecraft and are awakened and turned into human beings in time to actually explore that region. So this is all visionary stuff. It's aspirational, which this whole dream is, and that's a good thing to have, but it's, it's also good to be realistic about it. And if I wanted to summarize, to me, the difference between the, uh, the first renaissance and the second renaissance, the first renaissance, which we're still in now, exploring the solar system, that's engineering that already exists, or you could call it next step engineering. We think we know how to attack it as Davis showed very well in a, in a lot of detail. The second renaissance, getting to the stars, that's engineering that we can only imagine, or a scientific breakthrough that might or might not come true. We don't know yet. We still think the theory of relativity is correct and will never exceed the speed of light. And one final comment, because it applies right here. In this morning's paper, the local paper, there was a notice that the, uh, the uh, Aeronautics and astronautics people at this university have just gotten a grant from NASA, guess what, to develop robots to do asteroid mining. So robots may indeed be the future, the next millennium, the next renaissance, and we unfortunately or fortunately have to share our hum humanity with our mechanical, we hope, partners and not servants. Thank you. Thank you, Sydney. Just a reminder, if, uh, before we get to David, if uh, you want to ask a question, feel free to do it in the app. Just hit the live Q&A. We've got, got a lot of good ones coming in already. Uh, or raise your hand and a producer will get you a note card. David. Thank you. Um, as an academic who has not spent time in DC, uh, I don't have any bold, exciting predictions to make. But I did do what academics do, and that's a literature review to start this out. Um, turns out that. Coincidentally, yesterday, April 9th, 1959, the Mercury 7 astronauts were introduced to the world. Um, so that was 58 years ago. Uh, also, this week, April 12th, 1961, anyone know what happened then? Yuri Gagarin's first flight. So that's this Wednesday, 56 years ago. Uh, I remember watching the lunar landings in the late 60s, early 70s as a, as a young child. But interestingly then, my formative years in junior high and high school, the US space program was virtually non-existent, uh, at least in rural West Virginia where I grew up. There wasn't a lot going on. The shuttle was being developed, but it wasn't in the news every day. Between the end of the Apollo program in 75, and which was not yet in the history books, uh, and the first shuttle uh, launch, which coincidentally occurred also this week, April 12th, 1981. April's an important month in the space program in human spaceflight, which was 20 years to the day after Gagarin's first flight. Uh, there was not a lot of news about NASA at that point. It wasn't until I got out of college and I was fresh out with a newly minted degree in mechanical engineering and I started off my career as a space shuttle launch controller at, at Kennedy Space Center in 1985. It's hard to believe sometimes that was 32 years ago now. But what's even more interesting when I started thinking about this, that was only 24 years after Gagarin's initial flight. So really I'm further from that point now than I, you know, when I started than when I started with the first uh, space flight was for humans. Um, so my career has really spanned about half or more than half of the existence of the human space program so far. 
And I got to work with some really cool people um, when I was at uh, later in Mission Control in Houston with people like Chris Kraft and Gene Kranz and John Young, just to name a few. These were the icons of the space program. They were down the hall from me. I didn't even, I just knew it was Chris, and I didn't even know who they were at that time. I even worked with people at the Cape who knew Werner von Braun. You know, they had been there in that era, in that transition time. So looking back on it, it was really cool, and I don't think I appreciated it at the time. So maybe that was the first Renaissance time frame. Even though I missed the, the infamous so-called space race, uh, I did catch the tail end of the early days as the Cold War was winding down. They were still uh, very secretive, and it was, it was a very different environment back at that point in time in the late 80s, early 90s. And now it's extending into the exciting new world of commercial space flight, or perhaps this second renaissance. Um, the, the people often ask, what did it feel like when the shuttle program ended? And the, the word that I've used over and over, and I've heard many other people say, is bittersweet. It's an interesting word because you're sort of sad to see it in, but you're glad that it went out on a good note. And that really was, I think, then the transition. That's the beginning of a new era. The space shuttle was gone. It flew for 35 years. It's in the, it's in the museums now. Great exhibits if you haven't ever gone to see some of the ones around the country, by the way. Uh, people tend to forget that, unlike at the end of Apollo, when the shuttle program ended, we still have an international space station. We had people living on board continuously for almost 17 years now, this coming up uh, November. So we've got, still got a space program going on, and we're learning a lot about operations of keeping people in space. And I think that's a much more impressive accomplishment than it's usually given credit for. People lose sight of that. So now we're poised on the verge of this exciting future. <clears throat> excuse me, as called in this panel, a second space renaissance. Um, the transition from human spaceflight really being in the sole domain of government into the commercial world is phasing in. And there's really three different models of spaceflight right now. There's still the traditional NASA contractors building vehicles for the government, like Orion and SLS, that are aimed for deep space exploration missions. Then there's the public-private partnerships where NASA is essentially um, having industry provide transportation to and from low Earth orbit or the space station right now. And then there's the completely separate, essentially completely separate commercial uh, world where space tourism is really at the onset. So you've got companies doing different aspects of space travel across these different uh, modes of transportation. And for practical purposes, they're really all the same from an engineering standpoint. Uh, what differs is the business model and how they're funded and how they're supported. So that's going to, I think, drive a little bit of how the future unfolds here in terms of uh, what happens in the coming at least decade or so. And from my perspective, this, this three-pronged approach is really exciting from a career path standpoint for my students now in all aspects. I mean, some of them are really keen on going on toward the exploration-type missions. Others are really excited by these small companies that are starting to send people into space or planning to uh, touch the verge of space in the coming year, hopefully. Companies like Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and these, these, uh, these groups. So really, again, the biggest difference is really in the business model. From an engineering standpoint, um, it's getting people up and down into space safely is really the name of the game. There's not a lot of leeway there. There's not a lot of differences in that model in terms, ultimately, from an engineering standpoint. And it's kind of like with automobiles. Um, you know, space flight is risky, like any form of travel. Whether you're a personal car driver, rental car, or a taxi, or Uber, or maybe even self-driving cars. We'll see where that goes. But space flight is risky. Any, any form of transportation is risky. Life in general is risky. Um, so a big question remains, and I think this is going to be one of the drivers in the near term at least. And you know, everyone aims for safe designs, but the, the real question right now is how safe is safe enough? Uh, how much risk are you willing to accept? Uh, if you think about the shuttle program, lost two crews out of 135 flights. Uh, going forward, NASA has established this acceptable threshold of risk of loss of life of 1 in 270 or thereabouts, that number's changing a little bit. Uh, which is statistically four times safer by design than the actual shuttle record was. So this is useful for designers. It, does, it doesn't necessarily give you a good understanding as a potential spaceflight participant of how risky that is. So some of the work I've been involved with is actually trying to put that risk into a context that's more readily understood. Um, the risk of spaceflight, for example, is on average with that of loss of life from climbing Mount Everest in recent years. So, you know, a little bit more perspective, which isn't out of, the, out of the realm of possibilities for adventure sports and people willing to take that risk. This is, you know, four, five, six orders greater magnitude risk than uh, flying commercial airlines, for example. So, again, spaceflight's risky, life is risky, 
The second renaissance is going to have its own challenges in ensuring safety and creating a vi viable business model at the same point. Uh, you know, we have a saying, the only way to ensure that no one dies in space is don't send people there, uh, which really isn't going to be an acceptable outcome. So as typical with predicting the future, the reality that's going to unfold here will probably include things that we're not even envisioning today. Um, just, with the, just as with the European Renaissance that occurred in the 14th to 17th century, changed the culture of the world in many ways. Uh, I don't think these things were recognized until historians looked back in time on that. So predicting the future, you know, that's, that's, that's a tough business. Uh, perhaps best envisioned by science fiction writers, and even then, uh, the future may exceed their wildest dreams as well. And I know that I, for one, am, am really looking forward to seeing this next renaissance of how space travel unfolds. Thank you. Thank you, David. All right, we've got a number of questions. I think we should just hop right in. Um, and this was the first question. This wasn't a Phil Bias thing. The first question was about recycling rockets. You know, a few, just a few weeks ago, uh, SpaceX flew uh, a booster that had actually been landed and refurbished, uh, which was a first for a, for a vertical landing rocket. Um, there's a number of companies working on this. So this questioner is asking, is this the new normal? Is this the wave of the future, uh, re reusing and recycling rockets? Um, I, I can take that. Um, we, can, we can all comment, but absolutely yes. Uh, I hope so. I think so. Uh, because, uh, again, we need to, um, to get uh, more stuff, and people included, into space. Uh, you need to lower, lower the cost of, of launch. You need to really up the frequency of launch. And using reusables, the hope is that about 70% will be reusable. Now, right now, we're starting out with just a few percent reusable, really, literally, you know, fives, tens. But if we can get it to 70% reusable and keep going, you get the frequency up to where you need it, and you can really drive down the cost. So um, it's very exciting. Uh, I, call it, I think we're past that uh, kind of as a tipping point. So that proving the reusability, again, these are test vehicles. It's, I think it's good to think of these as test vehicles so far. But, um, you know, so SpaceX has done it. Again, Blue Origin has done some, um, you know, landings. And so I absolutely think it's here to, to stay. And uh, back to Dave's point, the business model, it, it seems to make sense. You know, I'll just add, you know, that, that those are remarkable accomplishments. If you've ever watched one of those rockets come back down the pad, it's just like a film going in reverse. It doesn't look like it should be happening. But people forget the space shuttle was also reusable. Um, you know, it was also intended to be high frequency, which it, you know, arguably was successful at, but I don't know the economics of it, whether they trade out or not. I just read this morning a comment by Elon Musk that uh, I think if I got the numbers correct, it was something like to build the rocket was some $60 million, to relaunch it was about $300,000 worth of fuel. So the cost-benefit analysis probably trades pretty well when they can maybe start to perfect that process. Great. Uh, I think almost everyone mentioned Mars as part of their, you know, second space renaissance opening remarks. Uh, this, this person wants to know why Mars? Why not uh, build a, you know, a big human habitat or colony in Earth orbit or go to the moon first uh, to, you know, test ideas for eventually colonizing uh, Mars? Well, I'm, I'm sure there are very good reasons for that, but uh, part of it is just the public's interest, actually. The public's interest in Mars, so there's that. But there's also the science interest. You don't learn, you know, quite as much science by just putting somebody into orbit, although that may be the best way to start a space colony. Uh, as you know, there are uh, plans to put tourist hotels in orbit around the Earth, right? And I listened to some guy at the Mid-Space uh, Development Conference years ago who would was actually from the field of marketing. He didn't know anything about science or engineering, but marketing. And he had done a market study about who would pay the several hundred thousand dollars minimum to go into orbit for the weekend. Right? And it turned out that there were a lot of people who would be willing to do it, and their interest was in weightless sex. So that apparently is the market driver. And his point was that he was coming from the motel business. As soon as you made eight units, you know, it was very easy to make 16, and then the cost comes down a little bit and so forth and so on. I mean, all of that is true, but Mars can answer some very fundamental questions to us. Mars went bad, as you know. When Mars uh, started out, it was probably a kinder, gentler world, to quote one of the presidents. And uh, how did it go bad? Well, one thing we've learned from the MAVEN uh, spacecraft is that you know, the solar wind has been stripping off the atmosphere, but it may also have been that a rock, a very large rock, comparable in size to the Earth, 
may have stripped off a lot of the Martian atmosphere. It's important to find out why Mars went bad. Sure, it's smaller and it'll lose its atmosphere a little bit, but th there's got to be some other reason why Mars went bad. Okay, and so that's important. And the other question, the big question about Mars, and the main reason we send all these motorized skateboards to Mars, is to learn, does it or did it ever have biology? Because that answers in one, one go the question of whether life is some sort of miraculous occurrence here. Mind. I would have a comment too. Don't underrate the power of culture and science fiction and the artistry about Mars. Even the engineers at NASA and the scientists at NASA, maybe, maybe the one to my right, will say that as a kid, he was at least partly inspired by reading about the possibility of life on Mars. So of course there's solid science behind the mission. Of course there's evidence that Mars might indeed harbor life, or maybe once did. But people, damn it, just want to go there because of this long history of attachment we've had to it. And I think that's really an important part of what's going on. I'll add, uh, just from an engineering perspective, I ab I'm absolutely enamored with the ultimate goal of going to Mars, but I think if I, I would take a little more personally conservative, pragmatic, systematic approach, and let's establish we can live in Leo, which we've done, check. Let's go back to the moon and set up camp and learn how to live where we're three days away from Earth, check, and then let's go on to Mars. I'll caveat that with we should have started that in 1975 or thereabouts, like was the original plan. But I do think there's something about being a little more systematic and stepwise getting there. I use the analogy in class sometimes of if you're, you know, going to go on a, say, a two-week backpacking trip in Denali, you've probably tested out your gear in your backyard, maybe made some trips to the local campsite, got everything organized, and then went off on your big trip, which is what I did one time. Yeah, that's, uh, I'll go ahead and, and, and add on now um, for some of you uh, who heard me speak previously, maybe not others. Uh, it is three phases. So we've been living 16, you know, going on our 17th years, low Earth orbit. It's fantastic. That's a place to spend people, maybe tourism. Earth is an incredibly beautiful planet. <laughs> you can always want to see Earth. When you lose the sight of Earth, it actually changes people as well. Uh, the moon, the moon is in, in the plans, in the world plans. Um, but again, who's going who's gonna to lead what elements of it is, is my point. I think we'll absolutely, uh, 2018, we're launching the Space Launch System, not with people, but to get to the moon. Those, those pictures you'll see, we've never seen Earth that far away since Apollo. Just those photographs, I think, from Space Launch will be another awakening. Wow, this is how precious Earth is. This is how beautiful it is. And some people absolutely, the rovers will be there going down to the lunar surface, uh, to, to Dave's point, you know, up to space station. Now, this, hours up. I'm a big sailor. So that's a, you know, that's just a, going to space station is just a quick, quick cruise. You get to uh, moon, the, my analogy is, you know, now you're days to week away from, in an emergency, really away from help. That's like going to the moon, you know, days to weeks before you, it's like crossing the ocean. So if you're sailing, which we've circumnavigated, you know, you, when you're in the middle of the Pacific, you're on your own, but you're days to, to potentially a week away. Mars, again, a different category. <laughs> Now you have to be completely autonomous, completely autonomous. When you get to Mars, you're on your own. So you need all your systems to work. You have to be really creative. You have to improvise. You know, when things break, and if we lose people, then you're on your own. So maybe another way to think about it, just step by step, you know, but really how far it is compared to the, the day trip, to the week trip, to the, okay, now we need all autonomy. People are always involved. I always say people are always involved. Either we're on the Earth, we might be in orbit, Operating a rover, so there's always people in our machines, always in exploration. It's just a matter of, I would say, where's the location of the people? And you might add to that, since we're talking about distance to Mars and uh, isolation from the rest of humanity, how long it would take just to get a radio signal from Mars back to Earth. You're now talking many minutes. If you sent out an SOS, it's 20, 30, or 40 minutes before you even get a response. So people who are on their way to Mars are actually living there for however long a period will be, I think, more isolated than any group of humans has ever been. Yeah, and just, if I'm sure most of you, if not all, saw The Martian. Um, and I know that that was a reasonably well done movie. It got most of the stuff right. I've heard the only thing that was really uh, way off mark was showing the really modern, fancy facilities at NASA, <laughs> which don't exist like that. But, you know, what, what does happen is, it, is it worth 
rallying the entire earth to save one person? This is, again, those questions of how safe is safe enough and how much risk are you willing to accept when you want to go off on these missions? I, I don't want to speak a second time here, but just to, so you don't make a mistake at your next cocktail party, the thing that was really wrong about the Martian was the whole installation being blown down by a very high-speed wind. There's a high, there are high-speed winds on Mars, as anybody who's been there knows, but it's... <laughs> But the atmosphere is Mar of Mars is less than 1% of what it is in this room. So even a 200 mile an hour wind well, isn't going to even extend a flag out, right? Okay, sorry, sorry. Three, three technical uh, footballs. We worked very closely with the Marsh. It's a great book. Andy Weir wrote a great book. He did great research. Uh, Ridley Scott, of course, he took artistic license. So the winds, it's good to know that, yeah, it feels like a feather. It would be, and there's dust devils all the time on Mars. They're, they're great. We can image them, but they would be like a very light wind. Spacesuits, mm, artistic license. They didn't have real life support systems in those spacesuits. And when you get that crack in your helmet, I mean, I love duct tape. I've flown a lot of experiments in space. That's a lot of pressure. That duct tape, you know, even, you know, I love duct tape. That's not going to quite work. And uh, the ion propulsion, you know, like great, big, huge spacecraft. Again, we do have ion propulsion, but we have little ion propulsion for the little Dawn mission, right? We don't know how to scale it up yet. So. These are the technical picks if, uh, of Martian. Uh, jump on them. The real Martians is a NASA website, you know, it, but they got almost all, and it's not going to be all potatoes either. It'll be diversity, you know, so those are the, uh, the technical quibbles, but it was a great movie. Yeah, but you got to say, Andy Weir, who happens to live in an apartment four blocks from the NASA Ames Research Center, probably is worth 20 times what the average scientist at NASA Ames is worth, even if he got it wrong. Good for him, and his next book is on the moon. There you go. <laughs> So obviously Mars is very in right now, from movies like The Martian uh, to a number of you know, countries and companies uh, looking at it, but there is a whole solar system, there is a whole universe out there. Um, but before we move on to them, one more thing on Mars. This question was, how do you view the relationship between these private companies and the public efforts? You mentioned SLS. Uh, this is NASA's rocket space launch system that will launch uh, its first flight in 2018. How, what, how do you see that relationship, you know, working uh, with the public and the private efforts, Falcon Heavy, uh, New Glenn, uh, other rockets and, and spacecraft and plants? I guess that's for me. <laughs> it's great. I mean, the relationship couldn't be better. Again, we worked all those partnerships. Um, so, again, from the government, working with um, as many companies as possible, redundancy is really important. Um, so when there, if there's two heavy lift launch vehicles, if you know the SpaceX is heavy, that's great. You know what? The government would love to buy services, buy cargo missions to Mars too. Again, um, right now for the astronauts, we'd like to return that to U.S. soil, dependent completely on the Russians now to launch the astronauts. Uh, Shane Kimbrough just landed today safely with his two Russian counterparts, and um, but yeah, we want Boeing to succeed. You know, you want we, all of us, hopefully here, you want SpaceX to to succeed to send astronauts up. But I think it's great that SpaceX and Boeing are competitive because you know what? That makes them both better. It's great that Jeff Bezos is, um, you know, really funding this on his own because you have his capabilities. So I look at it as the industry folks just make one another better. They won't all succeed. Some of them will go away. But having the redundancy, just over a year ago, there were, uh, well, 14 to 15, there were three accidents. Orbital went down trying to get cargo to space station. Then SpaceX had an accident. And then the Russians had an accident. Three accidents. You, probability wise, you could have never calculated that. It's never happened, but all three went down. You know, then it took a year to just under a year for the companies to get back up on their feet. So, again, from where I said, it's great for industry to push each other, but make mo no bones about it that, you know, government is funding them now so that they will, um, you know, be even better in the future. So, that's where I see it. Not competition with the government, but, you know, again, healthy competition uh, amongst the private sector. And I'd like to add to that, too. And, David, correct me if I'm wrong, but. Technically, NASA has never built a human-rated launch vehicle or a system. It's always been done by contractors. It's really a different business model, again, of are you funded as a contractor, as a partner, or completely independent, in some cases more recently. So it's not that this is really a new world. And I know from my time at the Cape, uh, and again later at, at Johnson, whenever there'd be a major contract change, you saw basically all the same people at the working level show up for work the next day with a new badge on. So it's the people who make this happen. The business models come and go, and they change and morph, and they adapt, and that's fine. I think the core people who are going to be making these things reality are really the same, very small, ultimately, community of engineers and scientists and all the other related uh, 
parts that go into that. So just, just keep that in mind that this is new, but it's not really new. Great. Would we uh, consider space tourism part of this next, maybe second space renaissance? Uh, one question was, you know, there's been a lot of talk of it for the last five, ten, even longer uh, years where, you know, the amount of people that have been to space is about 550 or so, uh, almost 600, and, you know, we could see that double in five or ten years once we start uh, getting, you know, space tourism going. But how real is that? Um, and which companies or approaches do you think might get us there first? I'll start off. I mean, there, there, there are several companies who are on the verge of putting people into space. Uh, Blue Origin is saying next year. I think Virgin Galactic is probably somewhere in that time frame. Uh, if you go back to, say, the early days of commercial aviation, I don't, I don't think it's an either or for tourism and exploration. I think it's both. And, you know, you had people flying, the barnstormers taking people up for joy rides back in this time frame. You had the U.S. Mail Service establishing a need for delivering air mail, so a government-funded aspect. And then you had the commercial airliners uh, starting up in the 30s and 40s, starting to transport people back and forth. So I think all these different aspects play a role in this coming renaissance. It's not going to be one thing only. Just to add to the tourism piece, it's, it's, um, you know, it's always been out there, but we are getting close to uh, realizing it. So in the next couple of years, um, definitely, I, th I think, uh, hopefully within the decade, we'll see you know, double, double the amount of humans. So a different definition of, of astronauts. Actually, a uh, new congressional language was, was passed uh, because astronauts used to be just government employees. No longer, you know. So what if you do have tourists? And it's already starting because, um, you know, some very wealthy people paid the Russians to go up. So we've had, a, you know, a dozen uh, space tourists uh, up to space station and down and, and back to, you know, Virgin Galactic. That'll, you'll go up for kind of a, a five-minute ride. I, I think that's about 300K. And there's a lot of people signed up for five minutes. I, <laughs> I, if you have the money, I guess you can do it. I'd recommend going on zero gravity probably. That's only cost you about 5K and you still get weightlessness. And then we'll get to orbital. So then space tourism. And so, uh, again, I think it, uh, once we get the launch capability, uh, I think you'll see it happening. But what happens in the first accident? Actually, Virgin Galactic has already had an accident. Uh, that's a former astronaut. You know, they had two pilots and, and one astronaut, human error. So uh, that's what I worry about, is I see this burgeoning uh, space tourism and, and going up again akin to the commercialization of, of flight of airplanes last century. But uh, will the first accident or accidents um, shut it down? That's, uh, that's, again, I think, out there to, to be seen. And then just add, that comes back to risk tolerance and how much risk are we willing to accept on a personal level or a company level or a national level, for that matter. And one thing that we do see time over time is with increasing activity, the cost and the risk come down. So you get smarter and you get more effective of, of doing this. So if we can survive the first few potential pitfalls, and they will happen, uh, hopefully the industry comes out stronger and more effective and, and safer in the long run. I just I want to add uh, the accidents that we've had with our, with our, with our shuttle crews as well. Um, they absolutely knew the risk that they were taking. You know, the astronauts uh, were very clear. It was very hard uh, again, for their, their families. But, but all of us asked them, we have a day of re remembrance from the Apollo 1 crew. Uh, to the Challenger crew, to the Columbia. So at the end of January, every year, you know, January 31st, we celebrate and honor our, the fallen astronauts because what they want us to do is keep exploring. I mean, they gave the ultimate sacrifice for all of us to keep their memory, but to keep exploring. So that really is, the, to me, the ultimate sacrifice, the folks who have already given their lives. And, um, but, you know, they would want us to, to keep going. That was their mindset. They, they took it as test pilots and absolutely knew that the, the risks and possibilities. So in talking about, you know, all these different ventures, space tourism, public-private efforts, I think this question uh, is a fun one. Never forgetting the power of a good lawyer, is there such thing as space law? Well, there is. In fact, uh, there's a, an organization that specializes in space law. now. <laughs> I don't know whether they debate whether you can sue the company that put you up in space with somebody you didn't want to be with for 827 days. But what they do regulate are things like, you know, can you commercialize the moon and stuff like that, right? That, 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 that is an obvious thing. It's very similar to the situation in Antarctica. Who, to whom does Antarctica belong? And uh, there, there is international agreement on that, but it's not 
really universal agreement in the sense that there are various countries that don't uh, subscribe to it. So if you know we were to discover oil, somebody were to discover oil easily accessible on the Antarctic Peninsula next week, you would see how this plays out. It all works just fine as long as there's really no contention. But as soon as there is, maybe it's different. But, but space law does exist. And a lot of it is very practical dealing with things like, for example, should space law get involved with one of the big problems in launching satellites, right? You know, you, a lot of people want satellites more or less at the same altitude because there are benefits uh, for low Earth orbit, geosynchronous orbit, and so forth and so on. And you put a lot of hardware up there, and occasionally, not often, but occasionally, two pieces of hardware will hit one another, and then it makes a lot of fragments. And if you think about it, if you've taken high school physics, it'll occur to you that the rate of collision goes as the square of the number of pieces of junk Right? So some guy down at, I guess he was at Houston, NASA Houston, a guy by the name of Kessler, just pointed out the fact that once you get to a certain density of, of, of things in orbit there, as soon as you have a collision, suddenly you get another collision rather quicker, and then the whole thing you know, goes wild. It's a chain reaction, and you turn the whole orbital space into dust. Okay? And at that point, it's hard to launch rockets to the moon or wherever it is you want to go. Right? Now, space law could deal with this by forcing people who launch things to deorbit them when they're dead, because most of the things up there are dead, right? But they're still there, a lot of them. So, you know, you either kick them out into space, that takes more fuel, or you kick them back to the Earth, or that takes more fuel. Either way, it costs money. And uh, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that space law deals with. I don't think it deals with anything like, you know, theft of your <laughs> buddy's spacesuit or anything like that. Space pirates. Space uh, there's, there's an angle to what Seth just said that I heard last night from an undergraduate here who told me about a course he was taking, uh, uh, the ethics of ecology. And when, one issue that came up was um, we have a lot of space debris out there because over, over the last few decades, so many things have been launched. Some of them stay whole, some of them uh, break into pieces. So one group of people would love to cleanse space of that for the reason that Seth said. You don't want new launches to have to fight their way through it. But there's a counter group that says, no, this is a natural museum of, of the human space age, and we need to keep it there. So it's a really interesting uh, dialogue. It's not yet at the level of law, but there's certainly some kind of ethical question to be determined there. And from my uh, somewhat limited experience exposure to space law, I think actually the word is more like treaties than laws right now. because. You know, how do you enforce a law when it's outside of your purview? We talk about airspace, but what's space space over our country borders? Uh, that gets a little tricky to define. Um, the FAA is proposed as the regulatory agency for commercial space flight right now. NASA is not a regulatory agency. If you fly to a NASA facility, you play by their rules, or if you carry their astronauts, you fall into that. But they don't regulate the, the, the world in that regard. I think FCC is the only regulatory agency that I'm aware of that's actually got a space-based mandate. But what's interesting about the FAA is they don't regulate space. They regulate from sea level to 100,000 feet above the surface. Uh, not, yeah, no, 60,000, sorry, 60,000 feet, flight level 60,000. So what happens when you're up there is a whole different matter, but getting up and down uh, it becomes an issue that does potentially require some oversight at some point. The other thing, the other part of that that is different than the satellite collisions and stuff, when you start talking about flying people, one of the things that we've been working with is trying to better relate what risk means for the sole purpose of a document called informed consent, which is along the lines of making sure you understand the risk that you're signing up for. Just to, just to add a little bit um, to, to that, it is much more like treaties. It's so the um, international organization that we talk about these things for, for law and, and policy is at the UN. So it's the United Nations Committee on the uh, Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. So that now has 85 uh, nations that are signatories to that with the annual big meeting, but other meetings leading up to that where when all these things are, are discussed and new nations can join. New Zealand joined um, last year, so that's a UN copious, we call that. That's again where the discussions, more like the, the treaties of the sea, you know, law of the sea, Antarctica, these are all kind of models, but we really have to, you know, again, talk about this internationally because the US doesn't own it now, so we're the most active. And, um, but orbital debris, just add a little bit to that. We talked about the civil space part of orbital debris and commercial satellites and things like that. Um, 
there's there's a lot of debris in in up in orbit and specifically in low Earth orbit and geosynchronous orbit. Um, right now, uh, when you uh, talk at the military side of things, um, it's anti-satellite capabilities, and um, only the U.S. and Russia and China have um, done anti-satellite. So that's, we have a satellite up and you, you blow it up and you make a lot of shrapnel. Matter of fact, you make thousands and tens of thousands of, of debris, of junk up there. So it just to, to go onto the space law, it's not you know legally um, regulated right now. So we do need to, to think about that. Right now, uh, you know, there are three nations who have done that. US and, and Russia agreed, uh, back then the Soviet Union agreed not to do that anymore. Uh, 2013 was the, the, the Chinese anti-sat. Um, demonstration and uh, so to be to be seen and to be discussed. So these are really important things to 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 think about. And again, so some of us over to the DOD side, some of us to the civilian side. It, just to make sure you're stultified, uh, there's one area we, <laughs> that that space law has not addressed, and some people think it should, and that is the question of uh, should we be broadcasting signals into space? <laughs> some of my colleagues, I, w I I wouldn't deign to call them colleagues anymore, but uh, some of the people I have known to, been known to work with, think that it's dangerous to broadcast into space because after all, you'll just wake the uh, Klingons up and they will come here and incinerate the planet. Um, that's a very expensive process and probably not in their interest, but nevertheless, there are people who are worried about that and they've tried to get this uh, UN committee interested in forbidding deliberate transmissions to uh, outer space, but we ignore that. And so does NASA. NASA sent a a Beatles song to the North Star in 2008. So, David, you, you touched on this with your talk and a little bit earlier, uh, but would love everybody else's thoughts. How, how do you see the role of people, you know, that aren't rocket scientists, uh, you know, that aren't in a science, technology, engineering, or math field? Uh, you know, what role can they play in pushing the boundaries with space and, and new initiatives, uh, especially, you know, from arts and humanities and stuff like that? Well, obviously, somebody mentioned the Voyager record. David did. The Pioneer plaque and the Voyager. Remember the Pioneer plaques? They were the size of a license plate. They were engraved in a bowling trophy shop in uh, San Carlos, California. Just out of San Francisco. I've been there. They, they still have it in the window. Anyhow, you know, had a nudie cutie couple, and the guy had his arm uh, extended like this. Some guy at the University of Washington assures me that's the universal symbol of war. Anyhow, they were... They were naked, which prompted a lot of people to write their congressmen and say, what is NASA doing sending porn into space as if, as if the aliens would be offended and so forth. But, so they changed their tune on that when, the, when they got to the Voyager record five years later, completely different. Everybody's in silhouette, right? You can't see anything. And, uh, but they put a lot of art onto that thing, in, in some sense art, uh, certainly music. And music... As you know, there were you know uh, there were like a, a dozen selections. Only one comp uh, composer got more than one selection, and that was Ludwig von Beethoven. He got two, but uh, <laughs> Johnny B. Good is on there. You know, Chuck Berry, who just died a couple of weeks ago, so Johnny B. Good is on that record. So and there was a uh, there were different committees, and they were you know they, they got a bunch of artists to decide what images should go on, and then they got a bunch of musicians to decide what music should go on this thing. And that was apparently the only contentious committee. The musicians really got into fights about what music the aliens should hear. The whole thing was put on an analog record with a little graphic to show, put needle in groove, right? <laughs> rotate record. And you might think, man, that's pretty old school, isn't it? And, but the, the reason that they used a record is because when this was done in 1977, as mentioned, the only other way to record this information would have been on magnetic media, you know, tape or a disc or something like that. And as soon as that got into space, the cosmic rays would erase it. So they went for a mechanical device. I would argue that artists have already had a big impact on the space program. Um, if you think back, we reached the moon in 1969. So, and some of that was due to public interest. There were other reasons too, like the space race with the Soviet Union, but there was public interest too. Public interest started in the 1950s and 1960s, and there's a very famous magazine spread in Collier's Magazine, which was then a very big deal. Not anymore, but then it was. An artist named Chesley Bonestell, who had done Hollywood work. In fact, he did the artwork for Citizen Kane, so pretty, pretty, pretty capable guy. Worked with Ferner von Braun to do a series of paintings 
of rocket launches, rocket landings, the Martian landscape, and other sites in the solar system. And they were full page spreads in Collier's magazine. And a lot of people who study this hysterical, uh, this historical, not hysterical, this historical era claim that Bonestell and uh, von Braun working together had a great impact on public opinion. Yes, you ought to go into space. It was absolutely as accurate as they could make it then. In fact, when Brown said he was scared of Bonestell because Bonestell had such high standards for getting the science right. So you can look this guy up on the web and you will be amazed at the realism and the photographic clarity of the paintings he did of all the interesting sites in the solar system that you can imagine. I actually just bought a copy of Colors Magazine on eBay. It's the first and only thing I've ever bought there. I won the auction with one second to go outbid someone by $5 or something. And it's phenomenal. I mean, they in the 50s, slightly off topic, but in the 50s, they, they really had figured it out. Arthur Clarke and Werner von Braun laid plans to go to Mars that aren't that different looking than what we're trying to do today. In terms of the question about the broader impact, I really actually think you could extend that. I think human spaceflight is somewhat of a microcosm of our entire planet, uh, especially when you talk about colonizing Mars. So anything you can imagine, and probably then some, on Earth that would be affected and contribute would be equally likely to in the future on Mars or wherever else we end up going with people. One other uh, super interesting destination that's in the news a lot uh, is Europa, a uh, fascinating moon of Jupiter. I think you know, there's plans to eventually uh, send a robotic planetary science probe there. Uh, should we just talk about Europa? What is the fascination? How do we get there? What do we do when we get there? And uh, is, you know, what are the chances of finding uh, something beneath the ice? I want to put in a plug since Europa came up. I don't have a financial interest in this film, but if you want to see a film about space exploration that is not about Mars, but is about Europa and does a good job of explaining why you want to go there and what you might, what you might find there, the Europa Project. It was a low budget independent film made two or three years ago. You can find it online. It explains a lot of the background, uh, the reasons why we want to go. Other speakers have mentioned a little bit. I'll say a couple of words and other people can chime in. Europa is pretty darn sure to have an ocean underneath a layer of ice. So once you have water, uh, all bets are off. You start looking for life right away. It's not the only one of the moons of Saturn and Jupiter that has water but it has very strong evidence, and it'll be one of the most interesting places in the solar system to go looking at. And by the way, Chesley Bonestell, who I mentioned in my previous comment, did some beautiful drawings of Europa that still hold up. That's how good he and von Braun were together thinking about how the science should look. I'll let other people come in further. Well, indeed, there, there are plenty of scientists, if you ask them, if you had one world to go to to look for my, uh, life, where would you go? You know, a lot of them say Mars, but almost an equal number will say Europa or maybe Enceladus. And the reason is that it might be easier to find life on Europa because of a recent development. Europa, indeed, is, as Sidney said, it's, you know, it's, it's a moon about the size of our own moon. It's covered in a layer of ice, has an icy skin. And, of course, you know, daytime temperatures on Europa are about, I don't know what they are, minus 270 degrees. I don't even remember whether that's Fahrenheit or centigrade, but what do you care? If it's minus 270 degrees, right? Okay, so that, that ice is not like the ice you pull out, the, out of your fridge, right? This is a different uh, category of ice. It's like granite, really. All right, but the thing is, there is this ocean underneath with twice as much water as you have on the Earth, right, just sitting there. And it's been sitting there for four and a half billion years. So maybe it's still sterile, but maybe something has developed in there. Because at the bottom of that ocean, you might have an energy source, these black smokers and so forth and so on. Okay, this is a well-known story. But how do you find it? Well, one way to do it is just send a lander to... Europa with a drill, drill down 10 miles. Nobody knows exactly the thickness of the shell, but it might be on average about 10 miles, something like that. All right, so you drill this hole, you drop down a, a, a nylon line with a hook and a, some bait and a video camera and a light, <laughs> and you see what's down there, right? Okay, that's expensive, and it's hard, right? And besides, you know, what if they're not biting that day or something? I don't know. Okay, so it turns out it's easier because recently uh, the... The, the Europa has been seen to have geysers. It's shooting up some, some ice into space, right? Which means that some of that underground or that under ice water is getting squeezed through some cracks and being shot into space. 
So now if you want to find life on Europa, forget that lander, forget the drill, forget that whole, you know, all that tackle. All you do is you send a spacecraft to Europa with a catcher's mitt, right? You don't have to land, you just go around Europa, which, as David can tell you, it's a lot easier, a lot cheaper. You just go around Europa, and then, you know, you fly through one of those geysers with a catcher's mitt, you grab that stuff, you bring it back to Earth, you look at it under a microscope, and maybe you have found the Europans. So uh, that's mostly true. Um, but what's really going to happen is... Uh, um, so uh, Europa, the ocean worlds, I, I showed the, the picture of the ocean worlds. All of those are, those are the great, um, you know, five to, to seven destinations to go look. But we have to prioritize in the budget. So the Europa Clipper is the orbital mission to go, uh, go sniff, you know, go orbit so you can sniff. Because right now, that great lander that has to go through those, you know, kilometers and kilometers of ice, we don't know where to land. So wouldn't it make sense? And the first mission is an orbiter. Go there, sniff, get the chemistry. Hopefully we can do onboard analysis to even know, you know, is, is there anything there? And I showed a, a picture earlier of an Enceladus, because Enceladus also has plumes. So these are essentially, think of the Earth's oceans, you know, and the vents and things coming out. So scientifically, we need to go there and monitor and, and measure the how, um, at, at NASA, just to you understand the funding, for the Science Mission Directorate, who funds these, these types of missions, they ask the scientific community. So there's something called a decadal study. So get all the scientists together and duke it out, essentially go to, you know, with, run through, not through NASA, you run through our National Academy of Sciences. And these decadal studies are really important because literally there are a hundred science missions going on today, uh, but you can only afford so much. So these decadal studies prioritize Mars, uh, Europa, and Mars and Europa always end up essentially one and two. Right. So they are the highest priority missions now to go search for the evidence of life to look for other things, other high priority missions. But, uh, but so that's what's on the, the plans right now is the, you know, kind of the Euro Europa orbiter in the early 2020s, hopefully. Perhaps then later uh, followed by a lander, but we have to know where to land. You wouldn't want to waste all that money and, and then again, the fish aren't biting that day, so. Once we're doing uh, these interesting moons, we really ought to mention Titan, which is a moon of Saturn. And the intriguing thing about Titan is it also has liquid, but it's not water, it's methane, which is an organic compound it's not yet something that uh, would automatically turn into what makes biology, like DNA, but it's the right kind of chemistry involved there. It has methane lakes, and there's not, much that, there's not that much liquid in the rest of the solar system, so liquid is always interesting to find. Also, another interesting point, methane can be used in a rocket fuel. So one thing that NASA is maybe, I believe, exploring now, certainly will in the future, can we hop, skip our jump, and jump our way through the solar system, refueling with methane we find in different locations as we go? So keep your eye on Titan. It may not be up there with Europa, but someday I think it will be. All right, getting into the a little more far-reaching ideas, Seth, you mentioned a space elevator. Um, you know, what do you see as the possibilities with a space elevator? Why is it on the drawing board, and what is the likelihood of us you know, getting those technologies that are needed uh, to go up and down to space like an elevator. Yeah, it's great. You get to go up into space. None of those 12 Gs that you know, contort your, your, your face. Uh, you, know, you just have to stand there and listen to really bad music for half a day or something. Uh, well, I find the idea of the space elevator uh, uplifting. I mean, there's that. But the, look, the idea. This idea was worked out a long time ago, right? It's, it's, it's another high school physics problem. But what you do is you, you go down to the equator somewhere uh, and you just make a beanstalk, right, that goes up about 100,000 kilometers. And once you're up about 60,000 kilometers, uh, well, less than that, when you, when you get up to 22,000 miles, that's a geosynchronous point. You make sure that's the center of mass of this thing. Okay, you don't care about that. But what it is is that this thing will stay rigid, this beanstalk. It'll just rotate with the Earth. Okay, all right, so now you have a pole and all you have to do is climb it to go into space. Now, people have been talking about this for a while. The problem is the pole material, right? Because there's gonna be a lot of centrifugal force. It's going to have to withstand tremendous stress. Okay, so it has to have a tremendous tensile strength. And in fact, the only thing, steel won't do it. The only thing that will do it seems to be, you know, carbon fiber, right? Carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, are the answer to everything. Any question you get asked that you don't know the answer to, just say carbon nanotubes. And you know, eight times out of 10, you'll be right, maybe. So carbon nanotubes, but the problem there is the technology for the carbon nanotubes, so you can make a big sheet of, of stuff, which is your, you know, 
your, your, your beanstalk uh, is, is maybe 20 years away. I, I don't know. I talk to people about this, and that's kind of what they say. But here's the big, here's the big plus for you. If you go into a rocket today, you want to go into orbit, it costs, what, roughly $10,000 a pound, something like that, right? So whatever, if you weigh more than a pound, this could get expensive, right? Just take your <laughs> $10,000 a pound. Okay, but with the elevator, you get that down two, three orders of magnitude. So maybe it's, uh, you know, $10 a pound or, you know, something like that. Now you can afford it. Now you can afford it. So but, that's the advantage. But we can't afford the elevator itself, but let alone the, the technology is fascinating, the carbon emissions, but it's trillions of dollars in investment, trillions. So we have to wait for the trillionaires to say, oh, guess what? You know, I won the lottery and I'm going to put this in. So right now, that's the space elevator, again, science fiction inspired. We're, you know, a lot of the science fiction is becoming fact. We call it science fact. But the hit right now with the space elevator, even though I love the, the technology and the possibility of all of us going up for, you know, a cheap ride, is uh, trillions of dollars in investment. So that's the, that's the kicker right now. But if you'd like to look to the future in terms of the science fiction writers, there's a great trilogy, if you haven't heard, called Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars. And it really describes what life with a space elevator would be like on Mars and I think on Earth, too, for that matter talking about this transportation. So a really nice depiction of that. In fact, a great depiction even of the potential of what it's going to look like to colonize Mars in the coming hundreds of years. Another uh, thing I want to, I want to bring up, you know, because another thing that, uh, again, what about energy? Um, space, right? So we basically have infinite energy and power in space. So you'll hear a lot about space solar power. Again, incredible dream. We'd never have to, to worry about fossil fuels again. But that has the same uh, issue. It's that one's only with a B. Billions of dollars investment in terms of to, you know harness, if you will, solar or space power and beam it back to Earth. Possible? Doesn't defy physics, which is all the good news. But again, you know these huge uh, initial billions of investments. So, but that's another thing. Doesn't defy physics. So we're still intrigued about it. So we've just got a few minutes left, Seth. You want to jump in? I was just going to say it's cheaper than a wall, and you get all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, you know, if, if you really say you want energy for your gusto grabbing future, you just put solar cells in orbit. No emissions whatsoever. Beam the energy down on a microwave, you know, cover, uh, cover New Mexico with receiving antennas. Nobody will really notice. And, you know, and then dis distribute everything with high voltage transmission lines and you're all set with all the energy you can ever want. Glad I let you jump in there. <laughs> so we've got just a few minutes left. I thought we'd actually just go down uh, the line, maybe starting with David. Um, you know, we were doing some far-reaching technologies. You know, we're in this maybe new second space renaissance where space is no longer just countries. It's companies, it's private citizens, it's, you know, startup companies making toaster-sized spacecraft. These things we have in our pockets are basically spacecraft without a propulsion system. Uh, they've got sensors and cameras. So where do we see, or where do you see, you know, what, what does the space renaissance look like in five or 10 years? What's going on uh, in space? You know, we're just starting to recycle rockets. Uh, we've got, you know, probes all over the solar system. You know, David, why don't you kick us off? In five or 10 years, what do you think, uh, you know, our space economy and space uh, exploration looks like? Well, I guess, I mean, in five to ten years, I would say we should be seeing people routinely flying as tourists, I hope, at that point, and that industry getting settled. Um, you know, I don't know. I, again, I don't make predictions. I didn't work in, in uh, government in D.C. But I do think that what we'll see is a series of incremental steps moving in the direction, punctuated with periodic major breakthroughs that no one anticipated. So something like that, maybe that's a fair, uh, a fair uh, prediction of the future. Sydney. If you'd like another comment, um, I think there's a whole issue beyond the technology that we haven't really talked about. Uh, private enterprise will have a big role in this, but it looks like foreseeably so will the government or some combination of the two. Where will the money come from? Where, the where will the political will come from? Where will the popular will come from? It sure isn't clear to me that we have a clear path to funding these aspirational ideas some of which are more than aspirational. That might be important for the survival of the human race down the road. But as everyone in this room knows, uh, counting on uh, long-term scientific predictions to sway public opinion isn't doing very well. 
So I have some concern about where we will be in terms of the support it needs, the financial support and the political support to make all these wondrous things happen. And I'm not sure anyone can predict that, and I may be completely wrong, but I have some pessimism about that. Well, I'm the eternal optimist, so, um, and, and, and the, the ideal is five years is, is too short. I, I agree with David. We'll, we'll, we'll see many, many more people. Uh, but I want to uh, think about the commercialization of low Earth orbit when it really goes. And we have the, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, it'll be the next uh, eight years till 2024 on this big Cadillac of space stations, you know, the International Space Station. If, if the billion dollar bl drug, the pharmaceuticals, I think the real money makers would be pharmaceuticals or materials, material science and pharmaceuticals. We can grow crystals in microgravity that are essentially perfect, you know, without, so I bet, my bets would be on the pharmaceutical industry, perhaps the material science industry, if, because it hasn't happened yet, but if one of those is the next, you know, billion dollar drug or material, then voila, we've just commercialized low Earth orbit. That's good. That's good for all of us. Again, then you move out to kind of Earth, Moon, potentiality there for some commercialization. And then I'd say, you know, still let the governments do what the governments do best with some uh, great private folks, you know, move out to Mars. Because that, again, there's probably not a business case there. That's for the altruism, the aspiration of searching for life, searching for our origins in the universe. But um, 69 years from now, since uh, CWA, 69 years, I hope we have this conference at least in space, in low Earth orbit, we should definitely have this conference. So that's my prediction. In the same panel, we'll all still be here. I heard, yeah, I heard a longevity living to a thousand years. Like, I was on a panel, yeah, there. So we could have this conference. In, you know, I'm considering cryonics. Um, cool idea. All right, but I, I think that Dave is right in saying that uh, it's most likely going to be evolutionary rather than revolutionary in the near term, because that's what you asked about. But that could change. You could have what, what David calls a disruptive event. Uh, you know, I always thought, well, maybe what we ought to do is just send all the plans for the Saturn V rocket to the Chinese and, you know, have them do something in space that's so impressive that we get off the dime. Uh, maybe that's one way to do it. You know the NASA budget, what is it? One one thousandth of the federal budget, right? Zero point, uh, f zero point zero four six. Okay, it's bigger than I thought. Maybe we ought to cut that back. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I was thinking of the SETI budget. All right. Well, I was, actually, when it was a NASA project. It was one-tenth of one percent. Anyhow, never mind. Okay. But that's small, uh, admittedly. So, obviously, if there's a geopolitical reason to, go, to change things, to disrupt the evolutionary change in what we do in space, more and more, you know, bigger and better, farther, all that sort of stuff, the stuff that you can see coming, right, to change that, uh, maybe you just need something geopolitical that's disruptive. But the other possibility is that there's some research result that changes things, right? If we do find, for example, life in the solar system, right? That would, that would be obviously a disruptive thing. Or, I mean, there's this guy who lives, you know, in uh, the Bay Area where I am, actually, Yuri Milner, he's a Russian billionaire, and he has these breakthrough projects, and one of them is Breakthrough Starshot. And what he wants to do is send something to the nearest star, not you, something the size of a matchbook cover, right? but build giant lasers that are all phased up, put a sail on the matchbook cover, get it up into space a little bit, and then hit it with this laser, accelerate it to 20% the speed of light so it can get to the nearest star in a, you know, in a matter of decades. Now, I don't know what you can do with a space probe that's the size of a matchbook cover. I don't know how you get the data back, but look, that's a problem left to the student, okay? So, but, you know, this is coming out of left field, right? It's just a guy with a lot of money who's interested in doing something totally different. And those are the kinds of things that can make a difference. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Please thank our awesome panel. Uh, thank you all for attending and being fellow space cadets. Uh, and have a good rest of your afternoon.